I still can't choose. Maybe it's crazy, but I wish I could study a little bit of everything. When it comes to picking a line of study, bisexuals apparently can't choose. But according to Dana Terrace's The Owl House, they don't have to. Near the end of the season one episode, The First Day, the series' bisexual protagonist, Luce Nosita, receives permission to study every subject at her new school, Hexide. This permission was hard won. In accordance with the stringent coven system enforced by the magic world's fascist leader, Emperor Bellos, the school had previously restricted students to singular lines of study. Students could, for instance, choose the illusion track, the abomination track, or the plant track. Students who dared to mix magic wound up on the detention track. Only after the ever-curious Luce, together with a trio of fellow magic-mixing delinquents, saves the school from a magic-sucking greater basilisk, does their principal relent, admitting the worthiness of multidisciplinary pursuits. While the other former delinquents select two tracks each, Luce confesses she wants to study everything. Her wish comes true. She finds herself suspended in space. Magic adorns her in multicolored garments, against an abstract backdrop of blue, purple, and pink. Unmistakably, at least for this bisexual viewer, the color of the bisexual flag. Viewers were still a couple weeks away from watching the beloved Enchanting Grom Fright episode in which Luce and Amity dance at their school's version of prom, and from receiving Terrace's confirmation of Luce's bisexuality on Twitter. Nonetheless, we were already witnessing an unnamed but blatant association of bisexuality with boundary-defying, reimaginative potential. Blurring the cross-screen border between show and viewer, this association and its possibilities become incarnate before and within us. For Luz, and for us with her, it is a moment of synesthesia. Film scholar Vivian Sobchak describes this term in relation to cinematic viewership as the potential and perception of one's whole sensorial being, or else the prelogical and non-hierarchical unity of the sensorium that exists as the carnal foundation for the later hierarchical arrangement of the senses achieved through cultural immersion and practice. For Sobchak, synesthesia is a key component of the viewer's status as a synesthetic subject, a neologism that combines the terms cinema, synesthesia, and synesthesia, or an impression made on one sense by stimulation of a different sense, such as when hearing a musical note leads one to see a color. With a synesthetic subject, off-screen bodies of viewers and on-screen bodies of characters commingle in such a way that meaning, and where it is made, does not have a discrete origin in either spectators' bodies or cinematic representation, but emerges in their conjunction. Here, I read the moment of Luce's ecstatic actualization as a multidisciplinary student as a moment of bisexual synesthesia, whereby she experiences the potential and perception of her whole sensorial being as a bisexual subject, in all her multi-oriented capacities. The histories of bisexual stereotyping and bisexual culture inform my reading. As bisexuals well know, society's misperception of us as greedy and indecisive has often led to the indignant mandate to choose or pick a side. Hearing loses, I still can't choose, signals in the bisexual viewer an all-too-common dilemma, and her sad and shameful delivery of the line evokes the same remembered feelings. How can one, in all her multifaceted desires, fit into to a regimented world. Remembrance of this misfit status gives way to Luce's self-actualization. Against a history of erasure and derision, she emerges as a present tense bisexual subject on her own terms and in her own light. Katharina Lindner has observed that orientations towards sexual objects affect other things that we do, such that different orientations and different ways of directing one's desire means inhabiting different worlds. Through Luce, we can explore what it means to occupy a particularly bisexual way of being in the world. In her moment of educational affirmation, her bisexuality provides a backdrop not only for her multidisciplinary pursuits, but also for her several other multidirectional capacities. Her bisexual way of being in the world is also bilingual. She speaks English and Spanish, and we might also consider her magical glyphs a language. It is also multiracial and multi 
multicultural. She is Dominican American, and she forms communities with members of various races and of various species. Her way of being is cross-world. She traverses both Earth and the demon realm. And last but not least, it is neurodivergent. She has ADHD. Given the lived body as capable of embodying curiously twisted habits, tendencies, orientations, directions, leanings, and possibilities, we can read Luce's I'm Gonna Study Everything as an invitation to consider together all of Luce's varied points of identification and their innovative potential, both within the magic world and across the screen into our own. This rendering of a bisexual way of being in the world has a critical historical basis. In the 1990s, June Jordan and Michael Du Plessis linked bisexuality to other heterogeneous identities. Jordan posits, I do believe that the analogy for bisexuality is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiracial worldview. Bisexuality follows from such a perspective and leads to it as well. Similarly, Duplessis asserts, We are not predictable. We are not uniform. We run off to the horizon and leave behind the borders on which monosexual, non-transgender theories, edifices, and institutions have been built. Bisexuality, at least according to these two theorists, has the potential to move the world. And viewers of the Owl House receive this world-changing potential through the ecstatic body of Luce before us. This on-screen birth of Luce and her multifaceted possibilities has the curious effect of pointing me backwards toward the past. Given that a viewer shares cinematic space with the film, but must also negotiate it, contribute to, and perform the constitution of its experiential significance, the specificity of my own experience as a viewer, past and present, informs my understanding of the scene. When I grew up in the 1990s and early 2000s, I had neither the Owl House nor a show that had any any explicit bisexual representation, at least none of which I was aware. Watching The Owl House now, I think about not only what I see on screen, but also when I see it. I experience what we might call a time-traveling spectatorship. As I watch the show in the present, I simultaneously imagine myself watching it in the past. Without losing sight of who I am now, I also automatically become my younger self, misremembering her as one who watched the show and, within and through it, saw, heard, and felt her identity affirmed. Film and television have the capacity not only to affirm, but also to create our identities. Films might not only speak to, touch, or move already formed identities, but they might play a part in their formation and their becoming. We get precisely a bisexual becoming in Luce's synesthesia. Anesthesia. Curiously for me, a viewer who recently turned 30, this bisexual becoming is retrospective. I misremember or imagine my younger self, together with Luce, stepping into and claiming the identity that feels true to me. At the same time, I know I did not have this experience. I suspect that for this reason, I remained somewhat abstracted from myself throughout my most formative years, and I imagine that most LGBTQ individuals and most marginalized individuals generally have a similar history of self-alienation. Catherine Bond Stockton argues that the category gay child is a ghostly identity that we may only apply retrospectively. For me, the category bisexual child is even more ghostly. Throughout my teen years and even into my 20s, I never really believed in bisexuality's existence. In those days, it hardly crossed my mind as a possibility. And yet, that is the identity I know now. I feel this knowledge, and I give it a name. I have become a living manifestation of that identity in language. The scene in the Owl House gives me the language of myself, applied both now and retrospectively. Bisexual becoming, at least for me, involves a dialogue between my present and past selves. While watching this show as an adult, I also imagine myself watching as a child, though of course I did not do so. Nevertheless, as I watch now, I imaginatively witness the incarnation of my younger self's identity. This past self then speaks to my present self and the future perfect. This is the identity you will have become. Although I know my past self never, in fact, said such a thing, our conversation persists. Such is the confusion and joy of an altogether bisexual time-traveling spectatorship, whereby one witnesses the present and retrospective affirmation of an identity formerly erased. 
This personal bisexual temporality has a broader social history rooted in by erasure, the systemic denial of bisexuality. Stephen Angelides traces how psychologists and gay liberationists used the term bisexual to define and maintain the sexuality binary before they then erased the possibility of its status as a present tense identity. Sexologists and psychoanalysts, including Sigmund Freud, located bisexuality in the past tense. They used it to construct the heterosexual homosexual binary, calling it an embryonic state from which hetero homo identities emerge, and then erased it to maintain the binary and solidify the diagnosis of homosexuality as pathology. In contrast, the gay liberation movement positioned bisexuality in the future tense. The movement put forth a notion of universal bisexuality and looked toward it as a utopia, only to then erase it as unrealizable until society does away with binaries. As a present tense identity, it does not exist. <laughs> Better to say that bisexuality did not presently exist. Made manifest in the ecstatic body of loose before us, bisexuality is here and bisexuality is now. As synesthetic subjects watching her on-screen synesthesia, we relocate bisexuality's failure to exist in the present into the past. At the same time, we do not forget bisexuality's past and future coordinates. After Luce's transformation, her principal reveals how a former student on the detention track, none other than Ida, Luce's mentor, wanted to study every track but, unfortunately, was never given the opportunity. Ida, whom we later learn loves Rain Whispers, Disney's first openly non-binary character, is also bi plus, an umbrella term that includes anyone who is non-monosexual. Ida's mentioning at this moment reminds us of identity restrictions that occurred not so long ago and still occur today. Luce, meanwhile, comes to the stage with future-oriented potential. I'm gonna study everything. In the present, Luce uses the present progressive, a tense that describes action which began in the past and continues now. At the same time, the construction going to, condensed here as gonna, points to the future. It is often used to express the present relevance of a future occurrence. In relation in relation to Ida and through Luce's language, the present tense moment of Luce's synesthesia points also to the past, what has been lost, and to the future, what will be done. Past and future collapse in on this kid and all her multifaceted, remembered potential. These coordinates collapse in on the viewer, too. Remembering past loss, I also look forward to a more equitable future. To be sure, queer kids today still face an uphill battle, but at the very least, the Owl House and shows like it help them know that they can and do exist. Affirming and indeed creating queer ways of being in the world, such shows give them the means to climb that hill together. The Owl House privileges community, and even with Luce at its center, it deconstructs the notion of the solitary hero. Called Luce the Human, this protagonist helps character realize that they need each other, and that only in the shared space of mutual trust and vulnerability may they succeed. Luce's light, which is bisexual, multidisciplinary, and multicultural, is also interpersonal personal. Her presence reminds us that progress is relational, and that in order to look forward, we need to look sideways. We also need to look back, to feel back, acknowledging histories of queer pain and shame, which for bisexuals is also a history of erasure and non-being. I understand that the suggestion to look back could lend itself to the hostile notion that queer people are backward, as could my adult viewership of a Disney cartoon. Well, maybe I am backward. I admit that this show, which spends a great deal of time on characters' backstories, prompts me to take an extended look at my own backstory. It also makes me remember my old suspicion, which is also my hope, that, with perhaps the exception of a select few, humans aren't born malicious that we are at our best when in relation to each other, and that if we can put off the fearful conscription of each other into narrow containers of misidentification, we can at last grow sideways, as a community, into the future. So call me naive, call me backwards. I admit I do not know much. What I do know is, when I watch Luz transform on screen before me, I somehow also watch my past self. And this past self, if she listens closely enough, can almost hear the words that we all say together. I'm gonna.